love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. That's a beautiful verse, isn't it? Would you agree with that? It's a beautiful verse. But the question is, what does it mean? I think if you were to ask most people what, what it means, I don't, I don't think they could necessarily explain it. The verse is kind of an enigmatic uh, verse, a, a mystery, I think it is, in the minds of some people. And then, what about the context? This verse is found in a section in 1 Corinthians that's addressing supernatural spiritual gifts, real miracles, miraculous powers that people in the first century had, Christians had. How does this verse relate to these supernatural spiritual gifts? And so what we're going to do tonight is study first the context of this verse, and we just might be surprised at some of the things that we're going to see. So let's discuss the context. 1 Corinthians, this letter, <laughs> it was written to a troubled church. The church at Corinth had almost every imaginable problem that you could think of. The church had division within it. They were exalting one man over another. There were brethren who were taking one another to law. They had immorality in the church. Uh, they had corrupted worship. I issues about marriage. There were so many problems. And here, in the context of our lesson, this was a church that abused the miraculous spiritual gifts that they had. And what we find as we go to 1 Corinthians, and go ahead and turn to that place, to chapters 12, 13, and 14, we're only going to do just a, a simple statement about each of, each of these three chapters, but we're going to be reading chapter 13 in just a few minutes. But in the context here, chapters 12, 13, and 14, three consecutive chapters address the issue of spiritual gifts. Chapter 12 talks about what the gifts were and how that they were given for the benefit of everyone in the congregation rather than given for one's personal benefit. Chapter 13 talks about the duration of the gifts, that is, how long the gifts would last. And then chapter 14 actually regulates the use of the gifts and tells the people who had those gifts how they were to use them, and it even tells them some circumstances where they were not to use the gifts. But these brethren, they were divided over spiritual gifts. Some of them were puffed up. They were arrogant. They were envious, jealous, arguing with one another about who had the best gifts. You know, God has given me better gifts than he's given to you. And that's not the intent of the gifts. That's a sad thing when people were divided over something that God had given for the benefit of everyone. Now, in that context of three consecutive chapters about spiritual gifts, at the end of chapter 12, the apostle speaks of something that he calls a more excellent way. Listen to this in chapter 12 and verse 31. He said, earnestly desire the best gifts. Spiritual gifts were good. The, the gift of tongues, the gift of prophecy, the word of wisdom, word of knowledge, these things were good, and, and the people should desire to have those gifts and to use them for the benefit of everyone. He says, but earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I show you a more excellent way. Now, the language itself, more excellent way, is contrasted to the spiritual gifts, isn't it? You can see that. And also the word yet. He says, yet I show you a more excellent way. And so what he is going to do is to set spiritual gifts and this more excellent way in contrast with one another. You see, the use of the spiritual gifts, whether it was tongues or prophecy, was good and fine. But there was something more important, something greater than the spiritual gifts. You see, these brethren had lost their way. They had all these issues over these gifts, and they had neglected something that was greater than the gifts. That's what he's saying here when he says, I want to show you a more excellent way. They neglected something that was more significant, and that's love. These brethren failed to love one another. Love should be the ruling principle in all their dealings with one another. But they had forgotten about that, and they were fussing and fighting over who had the best gifts. Now, what Paul is going to do, he is going to teach us that the more excellent way, love, 
is permanent. Okay? Hold on to that thought because it's a key thought. He's going to teach us that this more excellent way, love, is permanent while the spiritual gifts, as valuable as they were, would be in use only for a limited time. They would not go on forever. So that's our context. Let's now look at the text itself. And what I want to do is to read this chapter verse by verse and make only a brief comment on each of Paul's statements, okay? And, and what I want you to see in this as we go through the chapter is this contrast that he began back in chapter 12 and verse 31, the contrast between love and spiritual gifts. The first three verses go together as a unit, and they talk about spiritual gifts and sacrifice and martyrdom, all these things that would be good in and of themselves. But he says, without love, they're of no benefit. And so we begin in verse 1. 13.1 of 1 Corinthians, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. If Paul had the gift of tongues to the highest possible degree, could speak to angels even, and has not love, he's only what? He's only a noisemaker. Because he would not be benefited and others would not be benefited. Love must be the governing principle in all these things. In verse number 2, he says, Though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. He speaks of himself as nothing, even though he might have miraculous faith where he could move mountains. He's able to answer all questions, has all knowledge. But without love, he's nothing. Now, in the next verse, in verse 3, this is the third of, of this little group of three where he's talking about the, the, nece the necessary nature of love. He says, though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor. There he's talking about sacrifice. Whatever Paul has, he's going to give it all away to feed the poor. He says, though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor and though I give my body to be burned. Now, Paul wasn't literally going to do this, but he says, if I should do this, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. So, sacrifice, martyrdom, as, as great as those things might be, without love, Paul says, I am nothing. Now, in the next few verses... He's going to talk about the nature of love, verses 4, 5, 6, 7, and the first part of verse 8. And he's going to show that love demonstrates itself in action. Look at verse number 4. In verse 4, he says, love suffers long and is kind. Now, there are some positives. That's what love does. Love is tolerant. Love is kind to others. Then he mentions some negatives. He says, love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. Love is not puffed up. And, and the sad thing here is that with respect to these brethren, they were engaging in envy with one another, against one another. They were parading themselves, and they were puffed up and arrogant. You see, that was not a demonstration of love. In verse 5, he says, Love does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil. Everything in that verse is a negative. Here are four things that love does not do. Love is not disgraceful. Love is not about self. Love is not roused to anger. Love is not grudging. Uh, this last verse here, this last word in this verse, indicates literally to keep a record of wrongs. Love doesn't do that. And yet these brethren, they had all of these qualities in their lives and should not have had any of them. In verse number 6, you're going to see a contrast again. He says in, in 6, love does not rejoice in iniquity, that's lawlessness, disobedience to God, but love rejoices in truth. And of course, a lot of these brethren were living in disobedience to God. You, you only need to read through the book of 1 Corinthians to see how they were living their lives. In verse 7, he says, love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. The idea of bearing all things, love, love bears up under difficult circumstances. Love believes all things. That is, it believes the best about other people. That's the thought. It, it doesn't try to put the worst possible spin on someone's words or actions. Love believes the best about others. 
It says love hopes all things. Love hopes for the best for self. It hopes for the best for other people. Then he says love endures all things. Love is something that doesn't quit. Love does not give up. That's the point he's making. And so it believes the best of others. It hopes for the best, and it endures all situations. Now, in verse 8, a beautiful verse when it begins by saying, in my translation, it says, love never fails. I want you to think about that phrase for a moment. What we're going to see in this verse is a contrast between love, which is a permanent thing, and spiritual gifts, which are a temporary thing. Spiritual gifts are temporary. They're not permanent. They're not going to last forever. That's the point that the apostle is making. And so he begins by saying love never fails, but whether they, there be prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. And here he lists three spiritual gifts. Back in chapter 12, he listed a total of nine gifts. And, and what he's doing, he chooses three of them here to represent the whole group. Spiritual gifts, the miraculous, supernatural powers that was given to some Christians. Apostles had them. Apostles laid hands on others and gave some of them miraculous spiritual gifts. Those things are temporary. The three terms that the apostle uses here makes it clear that they were temporary. What you've got here is the value of love and the permanent nature of love as contrasted with these temporary spiritual gifts. He says love does not fail or love does not fall. Uh, for more information on that word that's used there for, for cease or fall, uh, look at uh, James chapter 1. James chapter 1 and verse number 11. It says, No sooner is the sun risen with a burning heat than it, than it withers the grass and the flower does what? The flower falls. That's the idea. The flower is done. It's over. It's wilted. It's finished. That's the idea. He, he says the same thing in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 24, that the flower falls or fails. It comes to an end. The flower dies. When the text here in 1 Corinthians says love never fails, a lot of times people have misunderstood that. They, they take it to mean, well, if someone loves you, if they really love you, they'll never quit loving you. That's not what it's about. This is about the fact that love endures. It doesn't have to do with whether someone loves you or doesn't love you. It's about the nature of love itself. Well, if someone loves you, they'll always love you. No, that's, this is about the eternal nature of love. Love is one of those things that is never going to fall. It's never going to wither like the flower. It's never going to fade but the gift of prophecy, gift of tongues, gift of knowledge, those things are all going to fade. He says, as he continues on in the verse, love never fails, but whether they, there be prophecies, they will fail. Some translations say prophecies will be done away. Another translation says prophecies will be abolished. Now, this does not mean that prophecies from the Old Testament somehow are not going to come to pass, or Jesus prophesied something, Paul prophesied something, but it's going to fail, it's not going to happen. That's not the point. It is the idea that these things will come to an end. If you look at 1 Corinthians 15, 26, just a page over from, from where we are, 1 Corinthians 15, 26, here it talks about the time of the second coming of Jesus and says the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. That word destroyed there is the very same word for fail as found in 1 Corinthians 13, 8. It's the idea that it comes to an end. It it. it ceases it becomes idle the gift of prophecy that people had would come to an end and he says the same thing about tongues he says whether there are tongues they will cease and the word cease there just means to quit to come to an end first peter chapter 4 and verse 1 contains the same word for cease it talks about a man who has suffered in the flesh he ceases from sin that means he stops Whatever he was doing wrong, he ceases that. That's the idea here. It is something that comes to an end, something that quits. And then in the latter part of 1 Corinthians 13, 8, 
Now, he said love never fails. It's not going to cease. But, but whether there are prophecies, they will fail. They're going to come to an end. Whether there, there are tongues, the gift of tongues, that's going to cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. Now, the word knowledge here has to do with the gift of knowledge or the word of knowledge that was mentioned back in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse number 8. There in that list of some nine spiritual gifts, the word of knowledge would be done away. It would vanish. The word used here means to make void. No longer going to be in effect. It's time has run out. But love, love will never be voided. Love will never vanish. It will never be abolished. Love will never quit. Love will never come to an end. This is the more excellent way that the apostle introduced at the end of the previous chapter. And it is set in distinct contrast to the spiritual gifts. So you, you see the idea here. On the one side, you've got the spiritual gifts like tongues, prophecy, knowledge, gifts of healing, word of wisdom, so on. On the other side, you've got love. This one over here is all going to come to an end. These spiritual gifts. This will never end. That's what it means when it says love never fails. Love is going to endure. And, and let's face it, folks, the spiritual gifts did come to an end, just as God said they would, just as Paul prophesied. He said they were going to come to an end, and they did come to an end at about the time of the end of the first century. By the close of the first century, the spiritual gifts came to an end. Nobody regardless of the claims that people may make today to having the gift of prophecy and word of knowledge and the ability to speak foreign languages that they never learned, in spite of the claims that people make, no one is able to actually demonstrate these things. No one has these powers today. But on the other hand, look over here at love. Love continues on, doesn't it? Love for God, love for one another. And so we say unto the Corinthians, y'all are fussing and fighting over these spiritual gifts, and what a tragedy that is because you're not loving one another. And love is the thing that's going to endure, not the spiritual gifts. Now let's look at the next verse, verse 9. In verse 9, he says, For we know in part and we prophesy in part. Know in part, that references back to the word of knowledge in the previous verse. Prophesy in part, that references back to the gift of prophecy in the previous verse. And, and what did these spiritual gifts do? The spiritual gifts, if you had the spiritual gift of prophecy, if you had the word of knowledge or the word of wisdom, what did it do for you? It gave you partial knowledge. It gave you partial prophecy. The idea of God revealing his will through you, through men. That's what was being done in the church of Corinth. These people actually had these miraculous powers. But they gave them partial knowledge and prophecy. That's why he said we know in part and we prophesy in part. But you know what? The church, God's people, they were looking for a time when it went beyond the part. If you've got the part, what do you want? You want the whole, don't you? You want the whole, and that's what, he's, that's what he says in the next verse, in verse 10. He says, when that which is perfect has come. That word perfect there means complete, whole, or mature. When that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. The partial that, that was given by the spiritual gifts, that, we don't have part of it anymore, he says. When that comes, we've got the whole thing. We've got the perfect, the complete, the mature. And so, and by the way, we need to mention that this verse is not about Jesus. You know, sometimes people just plug Jesus into that verse, and Jesus is not the context. The context here is about God revealing his will through gifts of prophecy, gifts of tongues, gift of knowledge. God is revealing his will, and, and his will is being revealed a little here, a little there. It's partial prophecy, partial knowledge. But he says the time is coming when we're going to have it all, when we'll have all the knowledge. And so when God's will is completely revealed, then that which is in part would be done away. Now look at verse number 11. It's an interesting verse. It says, when I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. What does that verse have to do with anything? Well, he's talking about the church. At this time, when they had spiritual gifts, the church was in its infancy. 
it was like the childhood of the church. And he said, just like in my own life, when I was a child, I, I thought like a child. I understood like a child. I, I spoke as a child. But when I became a man, I was through with the childish things. I put those things aside. And what he's saying is the church right now is in its infancy. It has all these spiritual gifts, and, and they're necessary because we're in the very beginning of this. We're in the church's childhood, our infancy. Ah, but it's, we're coming to a time of maturity. And when we come to that time of maturity, then those childish things, those childhood things will be put away. That's, again, talking about the fact that the spiritual gifts were only temporary. But he's got more to say. In verse number 12, he says, For now we see in a mirror dimly, another translation says in a mirror darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. Once again, he talks about partial knowledge. You see that in the middle of the verse? He said, Now I know in part. The idea of the mirror here, in ancient times, they didn't have glass mirrors as, as we have today, which is glass on one side and silver on the other side, silver of some sort, and we are able then to get a very clear reflection. What they had for mirrors in that time was metal, and you would have a metal mirror. It might be round like a small mirror we would have today, but that metal was polished, and if it was a flat piece of silver, you'd polish and polish and polish until what? until it became really slick, smooth, and now you could look in that mirror and you could see your face well. But while you're in the process of polishing it, what? Well, you only see, you see part of the image and it's maybe not clear, it's a little fuzzy, but eventually it becomes clear. And that's what he's talking about again. He's contrasting the time of the spiritual gifts. You know, here's a man in Corinth, he's got the uh, gift of tongues, another man has the word of wisdom, another has the uh, gift of prophecy, and you put all this together, and it was all good, it was valuable, but it wasn't the complete revelation. They were waiting for complete revelation. And so he makes this contrast in verse 12, now we're looking in a mirror dimly, but then when the perfect has come, when God's will is totally revealed, It'll be like face to face. We will be able to see clearly. He says, now I know in part, but then I'm going to know just as I'm also known. I will know God's will completely because it's all going to be revealed. That is the point that he's making. Now he comes to the great verse. In verse 13, when he says, and now abide faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Why is love the greatest? Because it will not only outlast the spiritual gifts, which are temporary. I mean, he said, that, he said that three or four different ways in this chapter. Spiritual gifts are temporary. Love is not only going to outlast that. But, but listen carefully. Love will continue on when faith and hope no longer abide. Did you see what it said? And now. That word now is an important word. And now abide Faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Love is the greatest because it endures into eternity. Though now, for the time when the spiritual gifts are gone, which is our time, he says there are three that abide. And the three that abide are faith, hope, and love. Not tongues, prophecy, and, and the gifts of healing. But what abides? The spiritual gifts are gone. Now we have faith hope, love, those three abide, but not in eternity. Those three do not abide in eternity. That's for this life, the now life that we have. When the spiritual gifts are gone, now abide faith, hope, and love. Someone says, well, you mean faith, hope, and love don't abide in eternity? Oh, one of them does, and that's love. Faith and hope do not. I, I was taught that on the radio a number of years ago, and a, a preacher called in and said, well, I guess then in eternity we're going to be faithless and hopeless, huh? No. <laughs> okay. I, I'm teaching what the text says, and I'm not pulling anything out of context. Faith. What happens to faith in eternity? Faith becomes sight. We're able to see what today we only have evidence for. I believe Jesus is the Son of God, and so do you. 
We believe in him. Why do we believe? Because of the evidence. The evidence presented by Old Testament prophecy, Jesus fulfilling that prophecy, the miracles of Jesus, his resurrection from the dead, all of those things are evidence. We believe the evidence, but we have not yet seen. Look in your Bible in 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and start at verse number 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6. It says, we are always confident knowing that while we are at home in the body, that's now, that's us now, home in the body, we're absent from the Lord. We're not with the Lord. The Lord is in heaven. He says, for we walk by faith, not by what? Not by sight. We have not seen Jesus. I know there are people that say, oh, I've seen Jesus numerous times. He appears to me and whatever. No, you haven't seen Jesus. We walk by faith. We believe the evidence. We do not walk by sight. But what's going to happen to faith? Faith is going to become sight. Verse number 8. We are confident, yes, well, pleased, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Look at that language, present with the Lord. When we see him, it will no longer be a matter of faith in the sense that we believe the evidence. We will see him face to face. We sing a song, face to face with Christ my Savior. So what happens to faith in eternity? It becomes sight. What happens to hope? Hope is realized. The thing that we're hoping for comes to pass. Look over in the book of Romans. I'm looking at Romans chapter 8 and verses 24 and 25. Romans 8, 24 and 25. It says, we are saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. Just like we're going to see Jesus, we're going to see eternity. We're going to see eternal life. We're going to be there, and it's going to be ours. But once you've got it, you're not hoping for it anymore. You know, a a young lady says, well, I I hope to be married next June. Well, after you're married, you don't go around in July and August and September saying, I hope to be married. You are married. Your hope is realized. Someone says, you know, I hope to graduate next year from Lamar University. Great. And after you've graduated, you don't keep on saying, I hope I'll graduate. You've got it now. You've got your diploma. You want a brand new car. You work hard. You save your money. You go buy a new car. You had that hope maybe for three years while you're saving your money. Now you've got the car. You're not hoping to get it any longer. You can see it. You've got it. Just like you can see your diploma when you graduate. The woman can see her husband. He belongs to her and she belongs to him. Hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for that which we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. So hope is going to be realized. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1, Jesus Christ, who is our hope. In the book of 1 John, 1 John chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. We hope to see him. And when we see him, it will no longer be hope. Hope is then realized. 1 John 2, 25, this is the promise that he promised us, even eternal life. Titus chapter 1 and verse 2, Paul said that he lived in hope of eternal life. And so we're no no longer going to hope to see him. We're no longer going to hope for eternal life. We're going to have it. There's a time coming when we're going to have it. And so faith becomes sight. Hope is realized. And what happens to love? Love continues on because we're going to be with the ultimate object of our love. We'll be with our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who's forgiven us of our sins, the one who had nails driven in his hands and feet for us. He is the object of our love today, and we're going to be with him. Love is never ending. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 through 9, just very quickly. We've got just a few more things to cover, and then we're going to put a wrap on it. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6, he's talking about 
what's going to happen, how we're going to go to heaven. But in verse 6, he says, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you've been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more than precious, much more precious than gold that perishes, though it be tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom, having not seen, you love. Most of these first century Christians never saw Jesus. But they loved him. Whom, having not seen, you love, though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Love for God. We love him now, even though we've not seen him. But when we see him, we will not love him less. Love for God is never ending. Love for brethren. As much as we might love one another today, love for brethren will be more perfectly experienced in heaven than ever on earth. Love is the greatest. And now, yeah, now in this time, abide faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Because love endures. It never comes to an end. Faith becomes sight. Hope is realized. But love becomes even more wonderful in eternity. Now, the fact that love is the greatest does not mean, does not demean these others or denigrate these others. Uh, faith and hope both have great value. In fact, in the circumstances of life now, each of these, each has value. And, and in some of the circumstances of life, you may need one of these over the others. I want you to think about that for a moment. When the days are dark and dreary and difficult, what do you need to do? You need to trust God. That's your faith. Remember Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6? Trust in the Lord. That's about believing. That's about having your confidence in God. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will direct your paths. You ever have days in your life when things are dark and dreary and difficult? You need to trust God in those days. And, and what about when you've done something that you know is wrong and you need forgiveness? You need to trust in God. And on a day like that, that's when your faith needs to be strong. You know, faith doesn't always mean, faith doesn't mean that things will always turn out okay the way we want. And sometimes, you know, you watch some of these guys on TV, they'll tell you that if you just have faith in God, life is going to be wonderful. Yeah, you get a bigger house, you get a new car, your kids make straight A's in school, everything is wonderful for you. Well, I'll tell you, there are days when things are not wonderful. And a lot of us in the last week or so have experienced things that are not wonderful, okay? Nobody looks at a flood and says, isn't this wonderful? <laughs> well, you might say that, and uh, that's uh, called sarcasm. Faith doesn't mean that things will always turn out okay the way we want. Faith means that we're going to be okay no matter how things turn out. We're going to be okay. And why? Because we know that our God will take care of us. And there are days when we, we've got to have that kind of faith, when we don't give up when we don't allow discouragement to overtake us. And sometimes discouragement is strong, but we hold on to our faith. And then what about hope? Hope has great value. When we're tired, we're weak, and we're worn and weary, we need to remind ourselves that we're going to a better place. Oh, people say it all the time at funerals. Oh, well, you know, he died, but he's in a better place. Everybody, I guess, goes to a better place, if you could believe what's said at funerals. But for people who are Christians, we really are going to a better place. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 5 says, Your hope is laid up for you in heaven. In the book of 1 Peter chapter 3, chapter 1, verse 3. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Listen to what it says about hope. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope. Living hope. Why is it living? Because Jesus is alive. Living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To an inheritance, incorruptible, undefiled, that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Folks, we're going to a better place. And on that day when 
when you're tired and you're weak and you're weary and you're worn out and you wonder, can I continue on? You, you can. You can because you've got the hope that is in you and it motivates you. There are days in my life when hope is what I need most. And then love. When I've been wronged, when someone has hurt me, someone in my family has hurt me, someone in the church has spread a rumor and hurt me, and I'm disappointed. The pain can be great, but I need to love like my Father loves. I need to love, on that day, I need to love like Jesus loves. Over in the book of Matthew, Sermon on the Mount, this is our last text, Matthew chapter 5. Jesus said, you've heard that it was said, love your enemy. You love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemy. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Jesus said we need to love that person who's treating us wrong, who's hurting us, spreading rumors and lies. He says if you do that, verse 45, that you'll be like your Father in heaven. Because he makes his sun to rise on the evil and on the good. He sends his rain on the just and on the unjust. Look, if you only love those who love you, what reward do you have? The sinners do that. But he said, I want you to do better. I want you to love those who don't love you. Those who hurt you. Those who speak against you. There are days when I need that the most. And maybe on that day, that requires faith in his word to love one who would be my enemy. That requires that I hold on to my hope. I will tell you, my brethren, there are days when I need all three of these. They abide now. I need these three essentials just to survive. And you're that way too because we all are. But in eternity... Faith becomes sight, hope is realized, and love blossoms in a way (laughs) beyond anything that we've experienced in this life. We're going to look back on faith and love, and we're going to say, my faith has brought me this far. My hope of heaven has made me persevere. And now I'm going to be glad as I bask in the blessing of God's love. Forever blessed, forever happy, forever with Jesus. And now, abide faith, hope, love, these three. The greatest of these is love. The ultimate blessings of God's love are for those who maintain their faith and hope in Jesus. Maybe there's someone here tonight that says, I need that. Don't you want the blessings that God provides for those who love him? And someday, you'll get to see the Lord Jesus. What a day that will be. We've got a song with that title, What a Day That Will Be. Like nothing we've ever experienced. Your greatest moment in life, the most wonderful experience you've ever had, will be nothing compared to that day when you see the one who loved you so much and the one you have loved in this life. Now you get to be with him forever. You need to respond to the Lord's call. Why don't you come now as we stand and sing? Come now, please.